Hey what's up everybody, in this video I'm going to look at Pepsi and Coca-Cola and try and figure out which one is a better investment right now. I'm going to dive into their financial statements and use intrinsic valuation model to try and figure out a fair value for each stock. If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan, I'm a business school professor. This channel is all about investing so if you're into that kind of thing, Hit that subscribe button to see more videos like this one. Alright guys, so here is Coca-Cola's website. You can see their products here. They're really focused on the drinks. You got sodas, vitamin water, smart water, Powerade, all that stuff. You know, they have all kinds of drinks. They're really focused on the drinks. They even have coffees. They got some teas. It's a little bit different over at Pepsi. You notice, of course, they have their namesake, Pepsi. They got Mountain Dew. They got, you know, orange juice and stuff. But importantly, they have a lot of snack-based products like Doritos and Lay's here. And if you click on food, you can see they own a lot of brands you're probably familiar with. Stacy's Pita Chips. Those are really good, by the way. Quaker Oats. And really, they kind of have a mix of, you know, new age, healthy food here. You know, they got the hummus, you got the pita chips. But you kind of have just some old school, you know, really unhealthy foods like Cheetos. Here's Coke's revenue by region. They're really not that transparent. You can see 66% of their revenue comes from international sources, but they don't really disclose much beyond that. I found Pepsi's financial statements to be a lot more transparent. You can see their exact revenue breakdown by country, close to 60% of their revenue coming from the U.S., and really no individual country accounting for a whole lot here. You see that 21% there in Burgundy? That is other. So that is a combination of other countries. So because Pepsi has a pretty significant uh, snack segment, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the breakdown between beverage sales and food and snack sales. So you can see when you look at different regions like Asia Pacific, you got Europe, Latin America, you got America. You know, no matter how you slice it, food and snacks account for a larger portion of their revenues than do beverages pretty much everywhere except Europe. So that's very interesting to note. I do see a lot more people drinking water these days. I like to see that they have that, that revenue stream coming from non-beverage products. So here are the balance sheets for Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They both have, you know, considerable leverage here. You can see their liabilities to assets ratio. Pepsi is a little more highly leveraged. When you look at debt to assets, it's too close to call there. Uh, as far as liquidity, Coke is in slightly better shape here. Their current ratio and quick ratio, both above one. Pepsi's are a little bit below one. I like to see them above one, meaning their current assets can cover their current liabilities, but Pepsi is not doing horribly here for the industry. As far as managing their interest expense, when you look at the interest coverage ratio, Coca-Cola is actually not in a great position with the interest coverage ratio of just about seven. That means their earnings before interest and taxes can only cover interest expense seven times. So that's not a great situation. Pepsi's doing quite a bit better, close to 10 times. So as a whole, neither company has a great balance sheet to be honest. Okay, so next we're going to do a DuPont analysis for Coke and Pepsi where we look at their ROE and we break it down into its three components. Check out my video in the description below if you don't know about this method here. So ROE, very important number. Coca-Cola 
is having pretty good ROE, an average of close to 30% over the past five years. Now, Pepsi's doing just about double that, an average of about 61%. So Pepsi, the winner here. Now, what is that ROE composed of? Let's break it down into its parts. For Coke, let's look at net income margin, meaning for every dollar of sales, what percentage do you end up keeping as profit? And for Coca-Cola, it has really bounced around a lot, but an average of about 17%, pretty good. It's actually quite a bit better than Pepsi. Pepsi's average net income margin is only about 11.6%. So surprisingly, Coke, the winner on margins, Although, you know, kind of intuitive, guys, if you ever drank Pepsi and drank a Coke, you know, I would pay a little bit more for a Coke. Asset turnover tells us for every dollar of assets, how many, how many dollars in sales can you generate? So this is really where Pepsi pulls ahead here because over the past five years, the average for Coke is 0.42. Meaning for every dollar of assets, they generate about 42 cents in sales. For Pepsi, it's pretty much double that, 87 cents. So Pepsi is making more efficient use of their assets. And finally, one of the key reasons Pepsi comes out ahead here is their equity multiplier. They have had higher leverage on average over the past five years. But I think it's worth noting, guys, even if both companies have the same leverage, Pepsi still comes out the winner. If you multiply net income margin by asset turnover, you get return on assets. And the product there for Pepsi is going to be greater than the product for Coke there. One of the key reasons people are interested in Coca-Cola or Pepsi is their dividend. And if you look at Coca-Cola, they're yielding about 3.1% right now. Not bad, guys. But the thing is, their payout ratio is 78%. So they're giving you almost all of their profits as a dividend, which doesn't leave them a lot of room to grow that dividend. I understand they've grown it for 58 years straight. That's wonderful, but I'm looking forward. And if you look at the past five years, you know, four and a quarter, average growth rate, kind of meh, and the payout ratio being that high, I'm not that optimistic about their dividend going forward. Let's compare to Pepsi. Now, Pepsi's only yielding 2.84%. However, their five-year growth rate average is 7.8, and their payout ratio is only 67%. So relative to Coke, they have a lot more potential to grow that dividend going forward. Here are total revenues in millions for Coca-Cola over time. Now, this is a pretty bleak picture, guys. In 2011, they raked in about $46 billion in revenue, is down to about 33 billion. Let's compare that to Pepsi. Now, Pepsi has had a bumpy road, but if you look at the big picture here and you zoom out, they've gone from 66 billion 10 years ago to 70 billion in 2020. So overall, Pepsi seems to be doing better. All right, guys, let's see what analysts are forecasting for Coca-Cola's earnings going forward. So we're looking at an expected 10% growth next year. You know, followed by 8.5, you know, 6.7, 7, 9 here. You get the picture, pretty modest growth, but at least some growth in earnings going forward. Let's compare that to Pepsi, and it's kind of more of the same. Pretty similar numbers here for the expected earnings growth in Pepsi going forward. All right, guys, so at this point in the video, I would say that Coke and Pepsi both seem like reasonable companies. 
I'm honestly, I'm not that thrilled with either one of them, but they're really not bad either. So I'd be willing to invest in either one. Let's see which one is a better deal today based on the expected growth we're going to see in earnings. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an intrinsic valuation model, the free cash flow to equity model, and try and come up with a fair value for Coke and Pepsi and see if one of them is a good deal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use those analyst growth estimates for the next five years. I'm going to show you guys what the value would be under different growth assumptions. Maybe analysts are a little pessimistic. Maybe they're being a little optimistic. And we'll see what the company's worth under all scenarios. All right, guys. So what you're looking at here is a valuation matrix for Coca-Cola. Every number here is the fair value of Coca-Cola stock given a certain discount rate or required rate of return and given a certain growth rate and free cash flows over the next five years. After five years, we're going to figure on 2% per year growth in cash flows. So guys, based on what analysts are forecasting, I think, you know, maybe eight, maybe 9% is the most reasonable uh, number here. But I put up the values from anywhere from seven to 10%. So for example, if you think Coke deserves an 8% discount rate based on their balance sheet and everything, and you think they can grow cash flows at 9% per year, that means that you shouldn't pay any more than $35.89 per share to buy Coke stock. Another way of looking at it is a required rate of return. So let's say that I only require a 7% rate of return. I think Coke can grow at 10%. So if that's true, then I should, I should be willing to pay about $46 for Coke. So is it a good deal? Well, let's have a look down below here where I color code it red if it's overvalued, green if it's undervalued, relative to the share price today and you can see it's a lot of red there so it does not look like a good deal here is a valuation matrix for pepsi and you know based on their expected growth it could be anywhere from seven to ten percent for the next five years after that just figure on two percent now is it a good deal? Well, I think probably you're going to be in one of these columns here. I think that's closer to the analyst average. And if you only require a low return here, it could be a very good deal. If you're looking for a stock with a 9% return, it's really not going to fit the bill for you. Let's visualize it. Let's look at the matrix below here where I color code it. So yeah, if you want just a 6% return, it's going to be a pretty great deal. If you want a 7% return, eh, it's kind of fair value, a little bit overvalued there. If you want anything beyond that, you're probably not going to get it with Pepsi. guys one last thing is insider trading so the insiders being the board of directors the ceo cfo all those people they're going to know a lot more about the company's near-term future than we are and for coke you see some some of them are buying coke stock in the past three months but there are more people selling when you look at the number of shares involved, it's, you know, close to a two to one ratio there of sales to buys for Coke. If we compare it to Pepsi, it looks a lot more even, 10 buys, 12 sells. And when we look at the number of shares involved, it turns out that there are more insider shares being bought compared to shares being sold for Pepsi. That's usually a very good signal going forward. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the content so far, please smash that like button. Really helps support the channel. All right, guys, here are my final thoughts on Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. I got to go with Pepsi. Uh, number one, you have the favorable insider trading activity 
Remember at Pepsi, we have net insider buying in the past three months. Usually that's gonna be a pretty strong signal. So I love to see that. The other thing is the intrinsic valuation. Coca-Cola is just not a good deal under any scenario we look at, any reasonable scenario. If analysts are way wrong and they're really underestimating Coke, it could in fact be a good deal. But in general, I rely on the wisdom of the crowds, the average analyst forecast, and under those calculations, Coke's a no-go. Pepsi is, you know, pretty fairly valued, slightly overvalued, but given the insider trading, I could definitely see buying Pepsi. And also just guys, you know, qualitative factors. I like that Pepsi has so much revenue coming from food and snacks. I see that as a lot more sustainable than, you know, soft drink revenue, which is declining. You can see that with Coke, they have dwindling revenue. It's going down. So really don't like to see that. I got to go with Pepsi. That's just my opinion though. Let me know what you're going to do in the comments below. Thank you for watching.